Hello, everyone, uh, and welcome to this virtual event hosted by Safer From Harm, which is a coalition hosted inside R Street Institute. Um, we are focused on bringing together diverse voices all over the country um, that are engaged in harm reduction in any of its many forms um, and in, with people and organizations and communities that might not be focused on harm reduction today, but for whom a harm reduction mindset might be an important and meaningful uh approach or, or part of approach to public health. So really excited to have you all join us here uh, for this event, um, which is called New Approaches to Tobacco Cessation Among People Who Use Drugs. I myself am extremely obsessed with and into this topic because I think it is under discussed um, and has the potential to be so impactful. Um, so thrilled to have our panelists with us here today. I, they are so incredible that I assume and hope I will be doing very little talking, which is great. Um, so I'll just do very brief intros. Um, we've got with us Rachel Simon, MD. She's a clinical assistant professor in medicine at NYU's Grossman School of Medicine and a primary care and addiction medicine physician at Bellevue Hospital's opioid treatment program. Um, so working with patients there who take methadone. Abby Coulter is a methadone patient advocate and reform specialist and the founder of MATSA, Medication Assisted Treatment Support and Awareness in West Virginia. And Stephanie Campbell is Senior Vice President of Strategic Solutions at Kent Strategic Advisors. She's an adjunct professor at NYU Silver School of Social Work, member of the Recovery Policy Collaborative in partnership with the Addiction and Public Policy Initiative at the O'Neill Institute at Georgetown University, and serves on the National Harm Reduction Steering Committee convened by SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, the Office of National C Drug Control Policy, and Centers for Disease Control. I am not sure when any of you gets any sleep, um, but we're really thrilled to have you. Um, as I said, we at Safer From Harm Coalition and R Street Institute look at harm reduction across a spectrum of behaviors and risks, from use of uh, illicit drugs to use of tobacco to sexual health, and importantly for today and in general, the intersections of those things. Um, I've gotten really interested in the significant intersection between tobacco use and drug use. Um, and the data to me is just mind blowing there. Data tells us that most people who use drugs also smoke tobacco. So um, for example, 12% of American adults smoke cigarettes today, which is a, a pretty stunning drop over previous years um, and previous decades, but more than 75% of people with opioid use disorder smoke cigarettes. Um, studies have found that quitting smoking is exceedingly difficult for people who use drugs. And I think we should care about this for a number of reasons, but one of them is that tobacco-related disease causes more deaths among people who use drugs than drug use itself. Um, that comes, ASAM, American Society for Addiction Medicine, tells us that more than half of people in treatment for substance use disorder, for example, will die from tobacco-related disease, many of them before the age of 60. So um, these are, you know, parents, siblings, loved ones, spouses, um, people who, you know, work jobs around us every day. Um, and so I think we should care about the twinning of these issues and, and talk about what tools should be on the table for these folks. Um, we do think, you know, there are a lot of reasons that this intersection maybe hasn't been explored more. One is probably the time scale for potential harms from drug use. So, you know, potential for overdose today or tomorrow versus uh, harms from smoking tobacco, which can show up over decades. So there may be an urgency difference when you're working with someone who's in the midst of chaotic drug use or problematic drug use um, versus someone who, who has been smoking cigarettes for years. Um, so uh, before I put the cart before the horse too much, because I'd rather hear all this opinions and, and facts from you all, I'll just bring in our panelists so we can hear directly from them about how they view this intersection and whether and when and how they think about bringing a harm reduction informed approach to tobacco and nicotine use with people who use drugs. So. Without further ado, Abby, I wondered if you'd kick us off by sharing your story, your lived experience in this space, which I think is so informative. Sure. Um, so I think it's important to start out by saying that I was somebody early on who absolutely was adamant that vaping was dangerous and it was something that I was not interested in and I could never see myself quitting smoking as it was. Like I was that person and my partner thinks it's funny now because he still smokes, but I was the one that said, I will never quit smoking. I It is the one vice that I will always have access to and will continue to move on with it. So it was probably about maybe six years ago. We have a son, He's oh, he'll be 21, but of course he hated that we smoked. And I was a pack a day smoker. I mean, it was, and, and I have to be honest, when I started, um, I've been on methadone for 22 years now also. And I even noticed early on when I started on methadone, a significant uptick in my smoking. I mean, 
I was smoking a pack a day easily. And I, you know, and a lot of that was attributed to the fact that I was moving away from, you know, a chaotic style of using drugs. And, but the real kicker was I was also pregnant and my smoking was increasing. So there were concerns there, but I think it was something my son said to me about uh, how much longer, I, how much less time I would be around if I continued smoking and why wouldn't I try vaping if it was even just a little less dangerous. So I accidentally quit smoking by vaping. It was <laughs> literally um, two weeks. I I realized, oh my gosh, it's been two weeks since I smoked a cigarette. Like, uh, and, and to be honest, you know, I was still hesitant at first. It took a lot of time to to find the right vape and the right this and that. And but I did, and the difference that I. I mean, just a whole health wise, you know, like that was something that the longer I had been doing this work and really started to come at things from a harm reduction approach, I looked at every aspect of my life. And I think to what, to what Jessica talks about around, you know, the urgency around having these discussions, it, it falls to the back burner because we are spread so thin and we're trying to do so much to fight and combat the war on drugs and that this just isn't one of those things that we see you know the dangers that are that are associated with smoking aren't visual you know they're not right here like you know a lot of the dangers with other substances are but looking at to you know i wanted to get to a place where it was more i was more centering myself around my whole health you know the the whole health outlook and just feeling like that was one area that, you know, at one point I thought this is what it is. It's not, it's always going to be this. And I was okay with it. So to the, in all honesty, the liberation from breaking free from smoking without even realizing that I had done it. Like, I can't emphasize that enough that it was just, it literally was an accident. And I'm not saying that it was easy and nothing like that, because it, I mean, full disclosure, I do still smoke cigarettes sometimes. There are times where the vape just doesn't cut it and I need a cigarette. So, but going from smoking, you know, a pack a day, sometimes more than that to, you know, maybe 10 cigarettes tops a month. I mean, that to me is, you know, that's, that is literally harm reduction in the process, you know, and finding ways and things that worked for me. I mean, I started out with, you know, the traditional big mod that people use like the juice with. And to me, that was a, a ha that was a hassle. I wasn't able to stick with that well, but the more I kind of connected with, you know, as vape shops came, became more popular and a lot of the folks that work there are really, you know, the ones that we frequent, they're really, they're really helpful and really adamant that, you know, like they know their shit, like they know their shit, like there's no two ways about it. You can walk in. And I think having access to that additional information was something that kind of sparked and made me really think about, you know, maybe that's why a lot of people aren't gravitating towards us in the same sense that I did. And the more I started talking with, you know, other folks in the methadone clinic system and, you know, other participants through some of our direct services, it, was starting to really take hold because there were a lot of factors that played into that. You know, the accessibility, the the money that you that I know I save by not smoking versus vaping. Like these things were in stark, like the, the contrast, the difference between smoking and vaping, just I didn't realize it until it started happening. And the more I talked to other people, the more I realized, you know, I wasn't alone. Like a lot of people just don't have the information and the information that is out there is really stigmatizing. I mean, a lot of misinformation around it. Like I said, I was afraid to start using it. You know, I heard all, I mean, I even had a doctor at one point, like I had asked, you know, I wanted to take this seriously. Like what are the benefits versus the dangers? And I was actually told that vaping was more dangerous than smoking due to bacteria. And I mean, there was a, a laundry list of reasons that she gave me that just, you know, in comparison to the dangers of smoking, it just really didn't make sense. So for me, it was just kind of doing my own research and realizing how hard it was to find some of these answers. And then talking with other, you know, other people who use drugs, you know, other people in recovery about their issues with why they haven't started vaping or, you know, what they're looking for, or a lot of people who wanted to, but just didn't know where to start. And, you know, like I'm talking about vaping back when, you know, it was more of a, 
I think a lot of people kind of saw it as a hobby too. Like a lot of the people that I was interacting with, you know, they were building their own devices and trying all these different things. So a lot of people I felt like were picking up on it, not necessarily to quit smoking, but I almost saw it in the beginning as, a, you know, well, what's the point if it's a new, you know, a new habit to pick up like this is, you know, but the more I learned about it, the more it just fit into that whole idea of, well, this is, this is another aspect of harm reduction. It may not be as urgent because of the other things that we're dealing with or fighting right now. But when we look at things from a whole health perspective, this falls right in line with that. And it was actually um, Helen Redmond that I connected with, who does a lot of tobacco harm reduction work. And I was at the time I was working in North Carolina with North Carolina Survivors Union. And we started working on projects around tobacco harm reduction. And that's really where I started to learn even more about it. And when my vaping became like it, it overtook my smoking without me really noticing. So for me, the benefits and of the education around it really started to bring things full circle. And then as we started talking more about bringing a 101 approach to harm reduction with the work we're doing through MATSA, I had brought up the topic of tobacco harm reduction and with the folks that we were talking with, this was something that they absolutely, it was one of the top things when we were kind of, I don't want to say polling, but talking with members about in the community, like what, what kind of information are you like, what do you want from Matt as far as this educational aspect of starting from a base approach and the tobacco harm reduction was the number two thing that was listed that they out of five, you know, so that people wanted to know more about, they just didn't know where to get it. So when I connected with Jessica around this, I was like, this is kind of cosmic, you know, like it literally was just a couple of weeks prior when we connected and I was like, okay, this is meant to happen because there is real interest around this. And then trying to think about, the different ways that we can, you know, combat the misinformation and, and ways that we can make that bring this into the fold and have the time and the bandwidth to, to make this an important part of the conversation and really being innovative and thinking about the ways we can do that. And this for me is a way to kick that off. So I'm happy to be here and do this. And we are thrilled to have you. I was so thrilled when we connected. And I will say, we know that your, to your point, misunderstanding and misinformation among clinicians is very high. There's various data sets, you know, surveys and polling of doctors and various specialties. And it, it it's quite high. Even our government agencies that if you click mm -hmm. and read enough, will say, yes, you know, these forms of nicotine consumption are much less risky than smoking. They'll still say, but it's not safe. You know, it's still the kind of right. fear. So we'll come back around to Rachel from a clinician's perspective. Would love to hear your thoughts on what on earth we can do about that. Um, and I'm taking copious notes now. I wish we had two hours um, of things we might follow up with. Um, but if we don't do it today, we'll find other ways to, because our hope is that we'll kick off with this, a series of conversations on this topic. But I wondered, Stephanie, if you could share a little bit on, on your side too, on Oh, we lost Abby. Hopefully she come back um, a little bit from, from your experience and perspective on, on how this shows up. Well, I'd love to hear from Rachel uh, from the, from the provider uh, aspect, and then I'll speak, I think, to bridge the gap between lived experience and also clinical. Sure. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, so I work in a few different settings cl clinically. Um, I work in a methadone clinic. I work in a substance use disorder intensive outpatient program. And then I also work taking in a clinic for folks experiencing homelessness. So in all three settings, I am taking care of people who use drugs, people with substance use disorders, whether they're in treatment or not in treatment. And I will say that among the folks I take care of, the rates of tobacco use disorder mirror national rates, which are, you know, upwards of 75 to 95%, depending on what sample you look at. Um, and that's four to five times what we see for a general population. So rates of smoking are really high. Um, I would say maybe five years ago when I first started practicing in this setting, um, I wasn't hearing a lot about vapes, but I'm hearing about it all the time now. So I have folks who are smoking cigarettes exclusively, people who are using both e-cigarettes and smoking combustible tobacco, and then also people who are just um, using e-cigarettes. Um, and so, yeah, it shows up a lot. I will say one thing that is important to note is that 
you know, even though I have folks in clinic who are in crisis moments, right, they need to get on methadone, they're in opioid withdrawal, there's some sort of medical or psychiatric um, sort of urgency or emergency, people really have an interest and a motivation in reducing their exposure to the harm of tobacco. Um, it is not something that they always want to put on the back burner. And again, when I was looking into this, that is something that has been found in you know, papers as well. So in a, the general population, around 70% of people who smoke tobacco are interested in quitting. And that interest and motivation and even the quit attempts are equivalent in general population and also with people who use drugs. The unfortunate thing is that for people who use drugs, it's often a lot harder to quit in the more traditional ways. So people who use drugs, they um, there's often such an overlap between other risk factors that make it more difficult, such as experiencing homelessness or unstable housing, having sort of preceding medical or psychiatric needs, being around a lot of people who smoke. Those pro-smoke, you know, social environments can also be a deterrent or make a barrier. Um, people who use drugs often don't have a longitudinal healthcare provider that can sort of like guide them through the longitudinal process of quitting and staying quit. So, um, and I will say that e-cigarettes have really changed the game in my practice. So in some, I would say, yes, um, tobacco is showing up all over the place. Yes, people are interested in exploring tobacco harm reduction and e-cigarettes are, are certainly changing the game. Over to you, Stephanie. Okay. Well, first of all, I'm just so grateful that this conversation is happening. It's so wonderful to see uh, Abby again. And uh, and I got to thank Rachel for all the incredible work that she did during uh, COVID when I would reach out uh, and need to get folks uh, access to care. It's, it's wonderful to have doctors who understand um, addiction and who know how to treat addiction and who care. So thank you. Uh, thank you both, Abby, for just all the work that you've done uh, for our folks uh, who are using medication, and, and also Jessica for, for convening us. Um, you know, I have an interesting sort of role, not only, um, you know, from a policy perspective, um, you know, those things um, are important, and I have uh, a lot of hats that uh, that I wear, but I'm a person in, in, uh, in sustained recovery. And what that means for me is that in 1989, um, I was living on the streets uh, and uh, in abandoned buildings and engaged in sex work and, um, you know, barely alive. And, um, you know, thank God for, for people with lived experience who reached out to me um, and said there was a there was another way, and I could not quit everything all at once. There was no way that I could quit shooting dope and stop drinking. You know, like like I was whatever I could get in my body to help mitigate the pain is what I was using to self medicate. And um, so it was a gradual process. So harm reduction made sense to me, even though we didn't at the time. I didn't have the language to describe it. You know, um, but um, but but it was sort of you know it was a layered approach. You know, I have to stop doing the things that are immediately causing me, you know, harm. I had to use clean needles. I learned about clean needles when I was still using, you know, um, uh, in, injecting drugs. And then I, you know, was able to, you know, stop using that. And I and but smoking was always a constant. And and here's the thing about smoking. For those of us who use drugs, just the act, the physiological act of breathing reduces our anxiety. And for those of us with ADHD, and I know that there was a question that came up, you know, ADHD, nicotine for me was very helpful. And I still do caffeine. I will never give up caffeine. Never. I'm just saying it. Um, and uh, and I still use nicotine, you know, um, but it's the how that I use nicotine that is that has been a game changer for me. Um, I would get sick every single year, first with, you know, bronchitis. And then I started getting uh, pneumonia. And I had a nurse say to me, you got to, you got to quit cigarettes or you're not going to live, you know, a, a full life. And so it was, again, a harm reduction approach for me was that I was able to stop, uh, stop doing that, um, it, you know, inhaling tobacco. I stopped using for a period of time and then, you know, life happens and I picked up uh, cigarettes again and, and I reached out to a friend of mine in the harm reduction world and she said, why don't you start vaping? And I was like, oh, please, that's what the kids do. 
<laughs> and and I heard that was even more dangerous than 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 smoking. Now this is some of the misinformation um, uh, that has that has gotten you know perpetuated. Um, and we know that you know thirty million Americans. Uh, smoke cigarettes and 480,000 die each year from smoking related illnesses. I don't know if anyone's ever seen someone die from a smoking related um, illness such as uh, COPD. It's a horrible way to go. You cannot breathe. And so, you know, and, and I know, um, you know, a number of people who tried quitting uh, and they failed um, that, you know, that the cold turkey approach, the, you know, the abstinence only approach um, is incredibly uh, difficult and uh, and emotionally uh, stressful um, to the point that you know uh, Rachel and 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 Abby uh, were were sharing. You know, people just it's another failure, just another failure. Um, and and traditional ways of quitting, um, you know, like like patches and gums. I tried those myself. I know lots of people uh, who try them. And here in New York State, under um, when I was the director of the statewide behavioral health ombudsman office. I cannot tell you, and Abby, it was heartbreaking to me how many people were on the phone with me crying, I wanna get help, I wanna get into treatment, but I can't quit everything. And there was one place in New York state where I could refer people to and they could still smoke. And, and there were people that died because they could not get into treatment. So when we start to think about, you know, and, and here's the contradiction, right? Government says, and, and we're taking a public health approach to the opioid um, epidemic, this the overdosing where we're seeing over 100,000 people that we know of. And I think that's a low ball number, uh, just for the record, um, who are dying, who can't get access to care because of misinformation that is is that is affecting policy, which is preventing people from being able to utilize, um, you know, a, a conclusive body of published evidence that shows that vaping is at least 95% less harmful than smoking cigarettes. And, you know, my lived experience aside, these this is the evidence, right? So we have to find ways in which um, you know, docs can be speaking to their their patients about you know the efficacy of reducing harm and and utilizing um, uh, you know tools like like e-cigarettes. Um, and we also have to look at policies which prohibit people, which keep people from accessing um, better health to reduce the risk of of tobacco related uh, illnesses by being able um, to to access um, e-cigarettes. Amazing segue. Honest to God, I think I could just close my computer and y'all would just do this without me. Let's yes. talk about what we know and don't know. And that's preferred. <laughs> you, this is all about y'all. What do we know and, and not know? Because there are things we don't know about vaping, about nicotine pouches, about various you know things that aren't lighting tobacco on fire and inhaling the smoke. So from a clinician's perspective, from a personal perspective, um, what do we know? And what don't we know today? Rachel, you want to kick us off? Sure, sure. Um, so I guess spoiler alert with you know vaping and that what we know about the health effects. So the data that we have certainly suggests that vaping is safer than combustible cigarettes. Period. We still have you know we still need more long term data to assess the absolute risk. So that's the short of it all. I will say to expand on that, and as we've talked about, you know, for adult smokers, basically, this conversation is really for adult smokers. You know, youth is a is another conversation. But for adult smokers, when we think about vaping and e-cigarettes, we, as we've talked about, we cannot think about this in a vacuum, right? We've we've listed off some statistics, but tobacco, you know, is the leading cause of preventable preventative death, one in five deaths attributed to tobacco-related illnesses, whether it's COPD or lung cancer or heart disease. And to put it another way, when you compare folks who smoke to folks who don't smoke, folks who smoke are will die 10 years earlier compared to folks who don't smoke on a population level. So these are, you know, we 
often, and I think the media will just look at vaping, but when we think about vaping, we need to understand that this does not exist in a vacuum and we need to think about the harms of tobacco. So I just wanna go out, start off by saying that. Um, and we all know that. And then, so when we think about, so how do we get folks off of cigarettes, right? And this is a question like, do e-cigarettes really help people quit? And we have, you know, two folks here who have success stories about how e-cigarettes have helped people, have to help them get off of combustible cigarettes. And, you know, the data suggests that is actually is the case for a whole lot of people. So the Cochrane Library, which is a large, you know, meta-analysis scholarly machine, put out a meta-analysis in January of this year that said, that there was substantial, very convincing evidence that e-cigarettes, at least in the randomized controlled trial setting, were very effective at getting people off cigarettes and then staying off of them. That's an important thing too, because there's often a return to smoking after you know a few months of quit. Um, but e-cigarettes really help people stay off of smoking for for you know the studies have up, up to a year, which is very impressive. So e-cigarettes are more effective than getting people off cigarettes, regular combustible cigarettes, than other more traditional nicotine replacement therapies and non-nicotine e-cigarettes. So we have that, and that's really powerful. That's sort of like new clinical news, I guess, that e-cigarettes really do work for smoking cessation. But then, so we have this thing that really works to get people off tobacco, but now we have people who are using e-cigarettes. So we really need to understand, right? What are the health effects of e-cigarettes? That's the million dollar question. And um, again, the data that we have is that so far, what we know is that e-cigarettes are substantially safer. Most of the harm from combustible cigarettes comes from the act of combustion, AKA the burning of tar that releases all these toxic toxicants that are then inhaled and are cancer causing, heart disease causing, COPD causing. Um, and e-cigarettes don't work that way. They aerosolize vapor. So it's a very different process of getting sort of like this different type of air into your lungs. And so when they've done studies comparing people who you know, switched from smoking cigarettes exclusively to um, using e-cigarettes exclusively, they have found a 90% reduction in exposure to these toxicants. So that's really amazing. That's really substantial. Um, how does that translate into you know, clinical outcomes? Um, the big studies, you know, have yet to come out and, you know, time will be the test of that. But I would say that the majority of folks in the, you know, in the research space, in the clinical space, you know, are, um, you know, definitely do view e-cigarettes as a harm reduction strategy. And in terms of e-cigarettes and what clinical data we have, we do have data that shows how Folks who smoke, who have COPD, for example, if they switch to e-cigarettes, they have a substantially less frequent incident of exacerbations of their COPD, um, which I think folks who use e-cigarettes will, you know, they'll, they'll come to you and they'll say, oh, my breathing is better. And so that is something that we have seen as well in studies about um, a reduction in severity of people's COPD. Heart disease and cancer, the data is not out yet, although people do suspect because there is a significant significant reduction in toxicant exposure that that will also be um, a positive finding. Um, so yeah, I guess I'll just stop there. Wait, one, I guess one more thing to add is the question of dual use. So um, I can talk a little bit later about how I can counsel people on e-cigarette use, but um, the data so far, when I counsel people, I tell people to try and switch as much as they can to just using e-cigarettes because the data on dual use isn't as impressive as for e-cigarette use alone. Um, the toxicant exposure with dual use is still pretty substantial. Of course, it's hard to tease out if someone has reduced, you know, in these studies, it's hard to tease out the people who are using both, um, comparing one person who is smoking one cigarette a day versus one person who is smoking a pack a day. It's hard to, to separate those populations. Um, but yeah, okay, I'll stop there. Uh, super helpful and, and brings up for me, I think, a really important question. And we're seeing some comments around this in the, in the Q&A, which is sort of more discussion happening in there. So I wanted to bring it forward is we, we, I, I see 
myself an enormous disconnect in what people think about where whether harm reduction is good for someone, right? In in drug use, we're willing to tell people how to reduce their harm in drug use and not tell them quit, quit, quit. So not necessarily completely eliminate all the harm, but make that activity safer for you, whether it's via usually a combination of sterile syringes, fentanyl test strips and other drug checking, um, taking methadone or buprenorphine, you know, whatever it is, this combination of things that does not eliminate this substance from your life 100%, but makes it a lot less dangerous to do and 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 your life more, you know, healthy. Um, but messaging does seem from many corners to be more absolute when it comes to tobacco and nicotine. So sure, vaping may be less harmful, but it's still harmful. And we don't hear, well, in harm reduction worlds, we don't hear that messaging when it comes to drug use. We hear there are complex reasons people use drugs. We're going to meet them where they are and help them find things that work for them. Where does that disconnect come from, do you all think? I can go. I There's a couple of things I wanted to touch on from what Rachel said, too. I think that disconnect... I think it comes from the hierarchy that we create around drug use, to be honest. I think that that's also a lot of where the disconnect with not addressing tobacco in a harm reduction, through a harm reduction lens. Um, we talk about, you know, abstinence being the, I hate to say this, but the push for abstinence being what drives a lot of people to, you know, end up overdosing or to other problems with, you know, with chaotic use. And I think when we, we talk about things in that lens through, you know, complete and total abstinence. I, if you had told me that I had to, if vaping would help me to completely quit smoking, I probably wouldn't have tried it. Um, the idea that I can just start out by reducing those harms made all the difference to me. You know, I think that when we talk about things and, you know, it seems to always go to that place around the substances, you know, of abstinence, a complete and total stoppage of whatever the substance is it put, it drives people away. You know, that idea that I have to completely quit, like I'm willing to try it, you know, because the truth is that people who use drugs want to be healthy. They want to have autonomy. They want to be respected and have dignity. And, you know, when a lot of the times when we're having these discussions with providers or, you know, going into treatment facilities, those conversations don't exist. The end game has to be abstinence or the conversations can't happen which, you know, we were talking before the, the webinar started about, you know, a story that I had around doing some advocacy work. You know, I'm in Morgantown, West Virginia, West Virginia University Hospitals, isn't it? it it's, a, it's an incredible facility for the most part. However, when it comes to substance use treatment, just like a lot of the places in the States, it's not practical. It's not, you know, the barriers that are set are ridiculous. They are what are keeping people out of treatment and killing people. Um, I was doing some advocacy work on what they call the addictions unit at WVU and walked in there and had six individuals, three of whom were ready to leave, were ready to opt out of needed surgery. Um, one individual was about to be uh, have a, an operation around having some issues with their endocarditis. A couple of other folks were just they needed to be there, but they could not smoke. They could not leave the unit, even though it was the, the unit was supposed to be to protect people who use drugs. The truth was it was to separate, you know, out of sight, out of mind. This was a locked unit. They weren't even able to get outside or to this. There used to be a smoking room in the hospital. Of course, there's not now. And, you know, at the medical facilities, this approach, you know, there is no tobacco, even for employees, you know, you cannot vape on the property. And at WVU, that means hiking about two miles, you know, to get off of what is no longer considered, you know, some type of property at, at the university. So, you know, this idea that you can't even, you can't even vape. So that makes it seem also as dangerous as, you know, cigarettes and that approach. But I think that disconnect comes from the forced idea of abstinence. Like, you know, this is a smoking cessation tool. No, I don't believe that. I think it's just like anything else. And when we can constantly look at drugs through this lens of hierarchy, you know, we the language we use around legal and illegal and and things like that are where that disconnect comes from. And speaking from personal experience and, you know, my experience working in the community of drug users, when we hear the word abstinence or that we have to do something, there's a there's a natural pushback to begin with. But then when you start talking about the things that, you know, you want to do to mitigate harms in your own life and that autonomy doesn't exist, well, then there's your disconnect. 
And I think it, the things, as far as the things we don't know around it, I don't think that people really have a good idea of what the options are around, you know, there, it's not just, you know, the e-cigarettes or, you know, there's a lot of different, you know, there's now like the Zen, you know, I see a lot of people that want to stop vaping going and using things like that, you know, I think, and, and the idea around, you know, I, I hate to think that youth, same thing around drug use, you know, I hate to think that youth are going to pick up vapes and use them when they haven't ever smoked a cigarette, but I would rather see a youth pick up a vape and start that habit than a cigarette. It, it To me, it's the same thing, you know, it's a lesser harm and, and teenagers are going to do drugs. They're going to smoke. They're going to do things. And when we have these, these, the ability to do these things in a less harmful way, it, I think it's incumbent upon us to have these discussions and to make sure that the information good and bad, we tend to do that. We tend to, you know, we see that a lot in the methadone system where the, the, there's tons of benefits and we know that there are also some things that are not, the greatest about methadone or buprenorphine, but we want to know what those things are so we can ourselves mitigate the harms that may come with that. So I think it goes back to the information and, and trying to find ways to, to not stigmatize these things and the information we're providing when we think about it. So, yeah. Thanks, Abby. Yeah. And I just want to say, I mean, we're having a kind of robust side debate here in the Q&A and um, welcome. I mean, we are a place that welcomes dissenting voices. Just ask folks to continue to keep that respectful. We're here, you know, centering the voices of two people with significant lived experiences in both of these intertwined worlds. They're not separate worlds, right? Um, drug use and 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 smoking tobacco. Um, and those stories matter a great deal to me the most. Um, and so I just want to make sure we're continuing to be respectful, even in, in dissent and disagreement um, as we talk about this. So appreciate that from all of you. Um, can we talk about the how? I'm just looking at the time and, and again, could go on forever with y'all, but could we talk about um, whether and how and when, I guess, are my questions, right? If you are supporting someone as a as a peer, as a friend, as a clinician, uh, you know, as a practitioner in whatever realm you're doing that, how you all, each of you makes decisions about whether to talk about the harm reduction options that might be out there versus, you know, medications and um you know, abstinence, a complete abstinence from nicotine or whatever, whether to do that, um, when to do that, if you decide that you might, um, and how to do that and 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 how those conversations go, what they look like. So maybe, maybe the the weather is the first question. You know, you've got someone in front of you, next to you, you know, in your life, whatever. Um, Rachel, you mentioned to me a kind of a, you know, thinking about whether now is the right time to have this conversation with this person. Would you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. I mean, so the question about when to bring up e-cigarettes, when to bring up smoking, I mean, again, it's it's just a matter of what's going on in the visit. And if um, we feel like it's a good time to talk about it, then I certainly bring it up. And I think what's so important is with these conversations to try and make sure we're being as non-judgmental and simply curious as possible and respecting folks where they are in this. So I try and just first of off get a lot of history, like learn about their smoking history, learn about what their goals are from their smoking, what they've tried, what's worked, what hasn't and why. Um, and so, you know, if someone is in a spot where they're smoking and they're smoking, they're not using e-cigarettes, but they're smoking. And that that's sort of less the case these days. But if that is the case um, and their goal is abstinence, I will really work with them first on, you know, the FDA approved things for smoking cessation, whether, you know, combination nicotine replacement therapy or varenicline. Um, and I will work with them to troubleshoot that and add on behavioral counseling to really optimize their chance of success. So I will go with those products because those products, I have a very clear understanding of the safety profile. Um, and, you know, that's more of like a, a straightforward thing. Um, and but, you know, that it's often not that straightforward. There's often like a lot of nuance. And what I'm seeing more these days is folks coming to me smoking cigarettes and using ease and using um, 
and vaping. Um, and in those scenarios, again, like lots of questions, what do cigarettes do for them that, you know, vapes don't, what are they looking to get out of, you know, what do, what are their thoughts on their tobacco use and all of that. But if they're using both, the first thing I will say is how can we get you um, vaping e-cigarettes exclusively or as exclusively as possible? Again, to the, reduce the risk of smoking tobacco. So that's what I will, That that's normally the direction I go. And when I counsel people on e-cigarettes, I try and guide them to the um, FDA approved devices because I, then I know they've, those devices have gone through the FDA. The unfortunate thing is that um, the FDA has only approved one device that has menthol and um, none of the flavored devices have been approved and folks, you know, adults love flavors. Um, so often folks are not using the um, FDA approved devices, but I will steer them in that direction if that's a feasible option. I will say don't tamper with the device one thing that is on people's mind, even though many years have gone by now, is E-Valley. Um, maybe folks remember that, but um, I think that contributes to a lot of the fear around e-cigarettes because of these this serious lung disease that happened as a result of um, not nicotine e-cigarettes, but tampered THC e-cigarettes, and the culprit was this um, chemical called vitamin E acetate. But because of that, and because it's the wild west out there in terms of devices, I will say don't tamper with your device. Um, don't add things to it. And um, exclusive use as much as possible. Um, monitor your respiratory symptoms. Let me know how that's doing. And then um, and then I say, you know, and then when, when we get to a point where we're just using e-cigarettes completely, like maybe down the line, we'll see how we can sort of reduce that because I don't think they're without harm. Again, I think this is harm reduction. I don't think they're without harm. So if that's, you know, something that could become of interest to you, we can certainly explore how to um, reduce the e-cigarette use. And I can certainly keep talking, but I'll, I'll pause for now. So that's, that's super helpful. Um, Stephanie, your thoughts. Yeah, I just first of all, I want to I want to thank everyone for being on this uh, webinar and for the robust conversation. Um, and um, you know, it 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 it's interesting because Abby and I have been over the years in conversations with even with clinicians and government uh, folks that thought that medication assisted treatment was just switching uh, seats on the Titanic. In fact, we were in spaces where that was said, right? Or that it was as harmful, if not more harmful. And um, and Rachel, you may also um, have, <laughs> have heard some of this misinformation. And so I think it's critical that in the lens of looking at um, an epidemic of which we've seen nothing of the, we've never seen anything uh, to my knowledge in my lifetime of the rates of, of, of death as they are right now with people who cannot get access uh, to the care that they need and reduce harm. That harm reduction is, is essential in, in all conversations that we have with individuals who use drugs, full stop. You know, this isn't a moral issue. This isn't, I believe that thou shalt not do these things because thou shalt not. It is um, It is that people have from the beginning of time um, tried to uh, reduce their pain and they use a whole host of ways to do that. Unfortunately, the drug supply being what it is right now, um, it's lethal. It's lethal. And so we need to be able to engage folks, you know, as clinicians, we need to be able to have the conversation in which we're using um, the most current um, uh, scientific, you know, evidence and, 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 uh, and evidence-based conversations that point to the facts. And the facts are there is a conclusive body of published scientific evidence 
that says that switching from smoking combustible cigarettes to um uh, you know, to to vaping is help. It 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 it, it is not as harmful as it is uh, in in tobacco. We need to have those conversations as clinicians. We need to have those conversations also um, with people who are struggling as as peer to peer. When I have someone say to me, you know, I'm terrified that um, you know I'm going to die from an overdose, but I can't get into treatment because I can't smoke. You know, we need to be able to have policy conversations in which we recognize the value of using all tools in our toolboxes. You know, Rachel mentioned FDA approved devices. These are not, you know, knockoffs from, you know, places that aren't FDA approved and that could potentially be dangerous. So we need to have educated, measured conversations and policy conversations in which you know, uh, we uh, we we inform folks that there are tools available um, so that they can engage in treatment and that they can be treated with dignity and not judged in a moral in a moralistic um, uh, uh, way. And I think this this notion that it's you know with the drug supply being what it is that it's either or either you stop doing everything and that's it or you know uh, or or you or you die essentially, right? Um, we've got to we've got to move away from that. We've got to give people um, all the tools that they need to be healthy. And whether or not people stop using, you know, nicotine altogether, um, I, you know, there were comments in the in the in the Q and A in which, you know, um, it 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 pointed out that 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 we need to be able. Um, to keep people alive uh, long enough to help them further. And, and I appreciate uh, that perspective because that's what we hear uh, as people, as, as providers, as clinicians, as peers, um, and as government that's trying to stem uh, an overdose death uh, tide that, that we've never seen before. Um, I think that's essential to, to keep that at the forefront. That that was so, like, I, I have to just add to Stephanie, thank you for that. That is exactly like, I think you were just in my brain for a minute because I think that that's it right there. Uh, we do this constantly time and time again around so many different things and we never seem to learn our lesson. Um, all or nothing is not, it's not feasible. The majority of us, and I think I venture to say all of us live somewhere in the gray, regardless, you know, this idea that you have to stop one thing or you have to quit to get help is another thing that just continues to kill people who use drugs. And when we're talking about this from a harm reduction perspective, to me, that is the only way that these conversations can happen because regardless, nicotine is a substance, you know, it's a substance. It needs to be viewed through that lens. You know, I, the story I was telling about the girls in the hospital, I can tell you right now, that if those girls would, if it had not been for the vapes that were, yes, snuck into the unit to keep them there, to save their lives, there's a good chance they wouldn't be here today. So, I mean, this, it may seem extreme. We say that a lot when we're talking about harm reduction, because we come from this place of the alternative is death from, you know, for the majority of us. That is, the, that is the alternative here in a lot of these instances. If we don't look at this through a harm reduction lens, you know, it, not having access to smoking for people who use drugs is another barrier. So the barriers that exist, vaping is another way to knock down some of these barriers, to get past some of these barriers, to keep people. And it's, it's recovery month. I'm not some, I don't identify as a person in long-term recovery because I believe that my journey is about whole health. There are days where I'm a hundred percent. My, my best is I'm lucky to get out of bed and go through the day. And then other days where it's still a hundred percent and it looks totally different, but it's because harm reduction is not just a buzzword. It's not just, you know, it's not the trend that you see on organizations, you know, signs nowadays. It's not just handing out naloxone. It is living it in every aspect of your life. And if we don't, stop viewing things as a moral failing or a failure and recognize that the systems that are in place that create these barriers are what is harming us, you know? So tobacco harm reduction should be, in my opinion, and I, I get it. I will do this every day. There's not always time or space or bandwidth to do these things, but 
we have to make that time to have these conversations. Otherwise, these are the barriers that we're constantly trying to fight. So the idea of looking at something and saying, you know, it's not actually cheaper or it's not actually healthier. Well, for some people, that's probably true. You know, that's that I know for me, it's saving me a ton of money a month. That's true for me. My health is better. That's true for me. But we have to also stop looking at things so black and white in such a binary way because that's not the way the world is. And the more that we understand that and and move in that direction, harm reduction is a center focus of that, you know, and I don't mean watering it down to where it doesn't really reduce harms in the way this is this is drastic. It's extreme because people are dying. And and this is another way that we can mitigate some of those harms and and break through some of those barriers. So I get it. I get it completely, but it can't be all or nothing. Or those numbers will continue to rise. I, I hardly want to speak after each one of you speaks because I just appreciate you very much. Stephanie, let's hear what you have to say. Yeah, I I a hundred percent um what what Abby just said and and uh and and um the other thing I wanted to just sort of touch on though is you know, substance use is the only chronic condition that we take this myopic approach, right? Um, you know, if I have diabetes, I have a whole host of, of, of ways in which I can reduce the harm that my diabetes has caused me. It's not moralized about if I have a jelly donut, I get, I don't get kicked out of treatment, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, um, I get, I get the care that I need. If I take insulin, that's okay, that's wonderful. Um, I don't get told I'm switching, you know, jelly donuts for, uh, for insulin, right? <laughs> like it's, there's such a, and I believe it, it all goes to stigma, right? Like we've been talking, I know Abby, we've been talking about this for decades now, right? Like it's all about stigma, but our community is the community uh, that folks, unfortunately, some folks uh, like to, you know, uh, get on the high horse and, 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 you know, and create these absolutes. And I think as providers, as, you know, as clinicians, as peers, you know, our work is to bring as many people into the space of, of better health. I love the, the recovery definition that recovery, you know, is any positive change. And some days to Abby's point, it may not look like positive change, you know, but I, I often say to the folks that I'm on borrowed time. I should have been dead in 1989, you know, after the, you know, numerous overdoses that I had experienced and exposure to, you know, HIV and, you know, hep C and all the things, right? I'm here. I'm alive. My children have, have you know, get to see um, a mother who has dignity, who who works, who pays taxes, who you know engages and advocates in 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 her community, who's a proud member of the queer community, you know. And I, I travel in a lot of different circles, right? But my kids, you know, have a mother who's alive and 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 kicking, you know. And that message, you know, when 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 we as 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 people with lived experience and and as you know as traversing the the many areas that we. Uh, that we traverse are able to carry that message of hope and healing. And it doesn't look, you know, my recovery doesn't look the same for Abby. You know, my recovery doesn't look the same for my, you know, my daughters, right, who are on their own journey. Um, but but to have the respect and to and to see, you know, people who use drugs as people deserving of compassion and care and dignity. And that's, you know, I believe when we approach, you know, public health in that space, um, you know, lives are changed uh, and healed and people go on to live uh, extraordinary lives. Um, so I just, I think that we need to be thinking about this not just in this space, but how do we treat this as a public health issue and how do we, how do we reduce harm in other, we're all practicing. I put my seatbelt on, I'm practicing harm reduction. I'm driving down the road, you know, God forbid I get in an accident. I'm not gonna go flying through the windshield, right? So we do harm reduction in in, in lots of, of places. We don't tell people you can't drive, right? Because <laughs> you might die. So let's bring that um, that energy and, and, that, and that compassion uh, into public health. Uh, and I think if we do so, um, you know, uh, we can, we can really help, uh, you know, stem the tide. 
I just love y'all so much. We have very little time left. I'm trying to look at the questions, but I think what we might do is maybe an email roundup with some of the questions. And we may, if you're up for it, ask y'all for some responses there. Um, but maybe we have time for a couple. Um, we had a comment from uh, Juliana Wilson saying, you know, then you're addicted to vaping. And I work with people who quit tobacco and nicotine products. So, you know, it sounds like sort of sw switching one substance for another um, argument. That's not what she said, but um, sort of trying to paraphrase there. And I wondered if y'all had a response to that. Abby, Abby's talking even while I'm mute. So I'm going to ask Abby for her. It's always funny. To, I mean, like the irony, like I used to get angry when people would say, oh, you got a methadone. You just switched one drug for another. You're damn right. I did. And guess what? That drug, that methadone has saved me for 22 years. It has made me a mom. It has helped me to be a mom, uh, a photographer, an advocate, a wife, a daughter. I mean, like without switching and this idea that feeling for me, it's more about feeling normal. I will say this till the day I die. I am a better version of myself with an opiate on board right now. The only safe supply I have access to is unfortunately in a methadone clinic where I have to jump through a million hoops, but I would do that in a heartbeat to survive, you know? I mean, that's the bottom line. And I think any positive change, that is that is what we have to start with. If abstinence is your goal from cigarettes completely, that's great, but we have to ask folks, what is your goal? And we can't just expect what we think. I don't go around telling people you have chaotic use with opioids. You need to get on methadone. That's not what I do as an advocate. I help folks to, to, to know the facts, to learn the ins, the outs, the goods, the bad, and to navigate those things. The first, at the mention that I try to push on to somebody, what I believe, I lose that. I lose them. And it has to start with trust. And if we don't, if we don't afford people who use drugs, dignity and respect, then the rest we can forget about. And trying to force people into these situations it doesn't work, you know, like it's, again, that's what harm reduction is about and for. So I think for me, trading one substance for another, well, that's actually the root of harm reduction. And when it comes to substance use, you trade one for a safer or you mitigate and, you, you know, your use in different ways. So I encourage people to try the other options that are out there, whatever the substance is, you know, it, it's it's a curve it's a learning curve for all of us but there are ways to do this that don't have to be about abstinence and and it is about whole health you know centering your whole health any positive change i put that in the chat it's funny stephanie when as you were saying that i was typing it in the chat and i was like oh my gosh you know like rest in dan big rest in peace but that is that's where this all started and that is what recovery is it's any positive change and it doesn't have to fit anybody else's idea but your own we are almost at time, tragically, uh, because I could sit here on mute and listen to y'all talk all day. Uh, we, I think, have the capability to go a couple minutes over if folks want to stick with us. Um, I certainly will. So if you all have to go, of course, want to respect your time and feel free to, you know, wave and drop off. But, um, you know, if we had had more time, I was going to ask y'all, how do we widen the circle? How do we get beyond with accurate evidence-based information, with acknowledgement that there are risks to these other products that people might try, um, but in a way that, you know, creates more tools for people for whom that might um, create a positive, any positive change. How do we, how do we get there? Given that there is, I think a lot of, including sort of historical and cultural resistance to the idea of harm reduction in the tobacco space due to the history there. Um, what do you all think is the best way to get there? And again, if you need to drop off, please do so without fanfare, if you need to just go. I, I, um, if I may, I think that what we've what we've done that has worked in other campaigns, right? We need to educate the public. Um, there's so much um, misinformation, and and sadly, the the harm perceptions of e-cigarettes compared with um, uh, with with combustible uh, tobacco uh, cigarettes have worsened. Um, and, and there's, you know, and that's been aided by overstated potential risks and inaccurate perceptions, um, in the media. Um, so, um, you know, I know that there was a recent, uh, study 
in JAMA in June of 2023 that found that more than half the population don't know that e-cigarettes are much less harmful than than uh, than uh, uh, combustible uh, tobacco smoking. And so I think there's an opportunity for us, you know, whether wherever we are in our spaces, um, uh, to 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 campaign to start a campaign to start a public health campaign that talks about you know uh, the different tools you know like we uh, again like we do with other public health issues um, that we've got to get um, you know we've got to combat the misinformation um, with with information with accurate information. Um, and that, you know, and no one's saying here that e-cigarettes are, are, you know, completely risk-free. I know or, or e-cigarettes are completely risk-free. I think, you know, like with anything, you know, we have to have longitudinal studies that, that you know, examine the data and the evidence uh, longitudinally. I know that um, uh, that Rachel had, had mentioned, um, you know, uh, the Cochrane folks, and they're collecting uh, metadata analysis, and, and that you know, that's a building body of evidence. But but we have to recognize and have a campaign, I think, that really articulates on the local, state, and federal public health uh, uh, policy initiatives that, that support, um, you know, e-cigarettes as an FDA-approved, you know, smoking cessation device that providers are able to get that information out to their uh, patients. Uh, that those of us, you know, working in policy and peer spaces, that we can, you know, have those conversations, um, and that and that we, you know, recognize that e-cigarettes could be a game changer in public health, um, if you know, government and 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 public health is able to, um, you know, make these smoking cessation tools available to individuals uh, who need them. That's going to greatly reduce uh, the substantial health risks caused by um, traditional tobacco smoking. Any other final thoughts, Rachel, Abby? Rachel. No, I, I would just echo the, the education need both, you know, in, in lots of different spaces and forms, we need definitely more input from our government, our federal government and our state governments. And I think that, you know, it, there's been so much attention paid to youth and vaping, which I'm not saying is a bad thing, but we also cannot forget adult smokers. And so there definitely has to be a, a nuanced approach to public health messaging about all of this and e-cigarettes as a, as a safer version and a, a useful tool for people who currently smoke cigarettes. Um, yeah, and I will say that also in the medical and clinical spaces too, I do feel like more messaging is needed and is happening about um, e-cigarettes as a, as a harm reduction strategy. So I think we need to keep building the momentum. Thank you all so much. I know we're now three minutes over, so I should wrap us up, um, but we're going to be coming back and and talking to you all again, because it just your experiences and your very pragmatic and compassionate approach to this topic. It's just um, giving me all the good feelings today. So really appreciate you all, your wisdom, your intelligence, your compassion, um, and being willing to share your experiences on a topic that not everybody loves to hear about. Um, and so I think that's really important. Um, we will be, uh, our street will upload the, the recording of the webinar. It often takes a day or two and we'll send that out in an email. Um, and maybe we'll try to do a kind of email roundup of some of the questions that were asked as well. Um, and really appreciate the, you know, robust conversation happening in the chat, um, in the Q and A, um, and appreciate you all for just diving deep on this topic, um, which we hope will be, this will be our first of many um, both event-based and written and other um, ways of approaching and talking more about this topic, which I think is so important to people's lives. So thank you again. Cannot say thank you enough for you sharing part of your day with us. And thank you all for attending. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Thank you.